always sum to one. All right, example two. Suppose the risk-free rate is 5%. Using the table below, answer the following questions. We're gonna plot the expected return as a function of the volatility. So that's done on the next page. But again, if you have the opportunity, go ahead and sketch it out so you can kind of see this for yourself. Calculate the Sharpe ratio and identify the optimal risky portfolio. What is the minimum variance portfolio, the one that has the lowest risk, and which portfolio has the highest expected return? Okay, before we move to the next slide, first, go ahead and calculate the Sharpe ratio given the information that you have. So you've got the expected return for each portfolio, you know what the risk-free rate is, and you also know the variance. So you can very easily calculate the Sharpe ratio for these portfolios. As you calculate the Sharpe ratio for these portfolios, you will observe that the portfolio that has the lowest risk, the highest expected return, and the highest Sharpe ratio are all different. They're all different portfolios. So go ahead and pause, take a moment, calculate your Sharpe ratios, and then take a look at the solution. Okay, so observe that the portfolio with the lowest risk, the highest return, and the highest Sharpe ratio, they're all different. These are all different portfolios. Also observe that there's a curve when we plot. There's a curve, you can see that, yeah. So what's interesting about this curvature is that we find the same behavior across so many different asset classes. So stocks, markets, over and over we find the same curvature, which is part of the reason why we have these theories developed of portfolio, optimation, of portfolio optimization. Because there's a curve, the way to think about this is every single point along our efficient frontier of portfolios, every point along that curve has a different slope. The slope of each point is the Sharpe ratio. So let's just kind of uh, unpack that. Thus far, we've combined multiple risky assets to form portfolios. Notice that the efficient frontier of portfolios forms a curve. We also identified the minimum variance portfolio. That's the one with the lowest risk. That's very easy to identify. The one that required a little bit of work is the optimal risky portfolio. We had to take our expected return for the portfolio, subtract our 5% risk-free rate, and then divide by our standard deviation or volatility. We will combine the optimal risky portfolio with the safe asset. That is, we will draw a line from the safe asset that is tangent to the efficient frontier. Why, why are we gonna do that? Well, that, that portfolio is gonna have the highest sharp ratio. So it will be the portfolio that's tangent to our efficient frontier. So what are we doing? We're taking our safe, we're taking all of our risky assets, we're forming portfolios that for every level of expected return has the lowest variance that we can get. Once we have all of those portfolios formed, there is one of those portfolios that dominates the other. There's one of those portfolios that has the highest Sharpe ratio. It's not the one with the highest expected return, nor is it the one with the lowest variance. That's an important thing to remember that sometimes can be a bit difficult to keep in mind if this is your first time to really investigate portfolio choice. Okay, so let's see what happens when we combine our risk-free security with the one optimal portfolio, the one portfolio that best offers this efficient compensation for risk. What do we have? Well, we have the cap M. So notice the minimum variance portfolio. That's the portfolio with the smallest risk, the lowest standard deviation. Okay. 
That's distinct from the optimal risky portfolio. The optimal risky portfolio is the portfolio that's going to be tangent to our efficient frontier. It's tangent to the set of portfolios that we formed that have the lowest variance conditional on expected return. This is amazing. This is the true building block of the global CAPM. The idea is that investors all around the world are performing the same calculation. So investors everywhere can observe how the markets are correlated. Investors everywhere can observe how the markets are performing. And because everybody wants the same thing, which is the most efficient compensation for risk and equilibrium, everybody holds the world market portfolio. So let's unpack that a bit. The CAPM is one factor model. It's a one factor model model that predicts investors only care about beta and that all other risk is idiosyncratic and uncompensated. It also predicts that the world market portfolio is the portfolio with the highest sharp ratio. And we just saw why. If we all have access to the same technology, the same information, and we're all risk averse, and we all want to have the best possible compensation for bearing exposure to risk, then we put all of our assets into a big portfolio, we minimize the variance of those portfolios, and then we're able to identify the one portfolio that has the highest sharp ratio, the optimal risky portfolio. So this is the same idea. We know that investors care. So in equilibrium, investors all hold the market since it's the optimal risky portfolio. Those are the predictions of the CAPM. In the real world, we know that investors care about characteristics that the CAPM says they should not. These characteristics are referred to as anomalies because the CAPM predicts that they should not earn a risk premium. Again, under the CAPM, the only thing an investor will be compensated for is exposure to the market. So if we observe that investors are able to earn differences in returns because of a security's size, its market cap, or because of a company's book to market ratio, or because how much a company invests its asset growth, or its profitability, and many other factors. If we observe that all of these factors influence expected returns, then we kind of have violations of our CAPM. We have anomalies relative to our CAPM. We also know that investors have a home bias. So we know one of the assumptions of the CAPM flat out fails, which is that investors are going to hold the world market portfolio. As we discussed last week, they don't. So what are we going to do? We will formally test some of the predictions of the CAPM and we'll examine how to add additional risk factors to the model to control for size, book to market, et cetera. To test the CAPM, we're gonna regress the excess return of a security on the excess return of the market. The test will examine whether the market can price the stock or bond or fund or event or whatever. So this happens all the time within economic and financial analysis. There'll be an event, or there'll be a fund manager or a portfolio. And what we want to do is we want to know whether or not the market or our risk factors can explain the difference in returns or the return performance of whatever it is we're interested in. So we've got a stock. You throw the stock on the left-hand side. You subtract the risk-free rate to get its excess returns. And on the right-hand side of your regression, you've got the variables that you want to use to explain what's on the left-hand side. Okay, so step-by-step, step, you'll take the excess return, you'll estimate the following equation. So you've got the excess return for the asset, regressed on the excess return for the market. EIT, EIT is the error term in the regression. You're expecting on average that the error terms cancel each other out or else you're not going to be able to estimate the error term. T 
T is denoting time. This is going to be a time series test. So it could be months, days, years, weeks, whatever dimension of time. What's our cap M prediction? Because our left-hand side variable is the excess return, that is the return for the asset minus the risk-free rate, our cap M predicts that alpha, the intercept, should equal zero on average. In words, there should be no arbitrage. Our cap M predicts that on average, the risk adjusted excess return should equal zero. If you're trying to figure out what all of this means or why this could be, think about it in these terms. Under the cap M, when we control for risk, which is identified via beta, and when we control for the market risk premium, which is the compensation that an investor gets for exposure to the market, there should be nothing else in expected returns. So the cap M predicts that we will not find a significant intercept when we regress excess returns on the excess return for the market. Also on average, stocks are gonna have a beta of one. So as discussed in the previous lecture, beta is the covariance of the asset with the market divided by the variance of the market. In aggregate, so when we add all the assets up quickly, the asset becomes the market, as the market is the valuated portfolio of all securities. So what does that imply? Well, if we're looking at the covariance of something with itself, that is the variance. So on average, because all of these assets, on average, summed up together, divided by, <laughs> on average, these assets create the market. So on average, stocks are gonna have a beta of one. For the next slide, use the guide that's posted on Blackboard to help set up the regressions. Follow it step-by-step -step to install the data analysis toolkit on Excel and so forth. So it'll walk you through how to set this up. Okay, so for, these example, for this example, the stock that you wanted to understand you want to know whether or not IBM is priced by the market. So what do you have? You've got the excess return for IBM and you've got the excess return for the market. Here, we're plotting the excess return for these two securities. What do you observe? Clearly, you can observe that there's a positive relation between the excess return for IBM and the market. Why? Well, when the market has a high return, so when the market's here and it has a high return, IBM has a high return. When the market has a low return, IBM also has a low return. So you can see that there's clearly a positive relation between the return for the market and IBM, which feels consistent with the cap M. When you estimate this regression, you'll get the following regression output. So just to explain a few things. First, the beta, the X variable, because this again is a one factor model. So the first, the only factor in this regression is the X's return for the market. You'll notice that IBM has a beta of 0.93 and it's highly significant, right? It's got a T stat of 16. So well above the absolute value of 1.96. So the beta is close to one, which is what we would expect. It's highly significant, okay. What's our alpha, the intercept, the excess risk-adjusted return? Is our intercept positive? Uh, sure, our intercept is 0 0.00137. But you know what our intercept isn't? It's not significantly different from zero. Why? Because our T-stat is considerably less than two. Our T stat is 0.55. So what does this mean? Do these results support or reject the cap M? These results clearly support the cap M. Why? Because the cap M says that when we control for beta, when we control for a systematic risk, 
there should be no risk adjusted excess return. There should be no arbitrage. And how do you find that? You can look and see that here in this regression, the intercept, the risk adjusted excess return is not distinguishable from zero. So there's no arbitrage with IBM. The market basically explains the excess return of IBM very well. Okay. The CAPM is commonly referred to as a one factor model or a market model because it predicts that exposure to the market is the only risk that earns a risk premium. That is, for the CAPM, beta is the only systematic risk factor. In practice, some of the many risk factors that have been shown to matter to investors, meaning that investors demand compensation for bearing exposure to them, include size. So size is gonna be measured by the market cap of the firm. You take the return for small firms minus the return for big firms. There's book to market, the firm's book to market ratio, the ratio of its book equity to the market value of the equity. Firms that have a high book to market ratio are referred to as value stocks. Again, book equity is on paper, market value is what's in the market. If the firm has a high book to market ratio, you can think of it typically as uh, being like a, a, a stock that has um, a good example of this kind of a stock would be like a utility company or um, a group like Time Warner, the type of companies that we think of as value because they typically have high cash flow and they, uh, have low market valuations relative to their book valuations. If this is something that interests you, or if you've heard this before, I'm sure you've heard of value investing. That's Warren Buffett's whole thing with value investing. What is that? Well, he's picking stocks that have a high book to market ratio. And then there's the low book to market ratio. These are referred to as growth stocks. So again, a low book value of equity, the firm hasn't had a ton of retained earnings, a high market valuation. So the firm may not have had a lot of retained earnings, may not have a lot of high cash flows, but the market really, really likes its growth prospects. So you can think of Amazon or you can think of uh, Tesla or any of the tech companies. You generally think of those as great examples of growth stocks because they don't have a ton of on paper performance, they have massive market valuations. Okay, so book to market, value minus growth, high minus low. Profitability, profitability, this is the Novi Marx, and the Novi Marx anomaly. The main idea is that firms that have more robust operating profits tend to have higher returns than firms that have weak operating profits. So robust minus weak. There's investment, the investment factor. So this is measured by the growth of total assets. And what we observe in the data is that firms that have an aggressive growth in total assets tend to have poor performance. So conservative are firms that have less asset growth minus aggressive firms that have massive asset growth. And then momentum. Momentum can be measured in a number of ways. These are basically buy and hold returns. So you look at buy and hold returns for three months or six months for uh, an intermediate window. And what you observe is that firms that had positive returns three months ago tend to have positive returns the next month. Firms that had low returns three months ago tend to have low returns the next month. So the way that people uh, will refer to this portfolio is often winners minus losers. You basically, you see that there is price continuation, that the trend basically continues within the intermediate period. And there are many more factors. And there are tons of papers in theory, each trying to explain why each of these factors would matter to investors. That's beyond the scope of our, of our class. What's the big takeaway? The big takeaway is that a good asset pricing model will control 
for the risk factors that matter to investors. So if investors demand compensation for their exposure to the additional risk factors, we should control for those risk factors. Specifically, when testing for the abnormal performance of a stock or a fund manager or an event, let's say there's a press release or a company has committed some wrongdoing and some information comes out, we wanna know how much, what, what's the effect of that information event on the market, whatever we're interested in, we're gonna to have to augment our one factor model with these various risk factors. How do we create the factors? Well, as we kind of discussed on the previous slide, each additional risk factor is gonna represent the return spread for stocks that are sorted on the characteristic of interest. So for example, the size factor, we've got the return for small stocks, the monthly return for small stocks minus the monthly return for big stocks. So you sort stocks by the market capitalization, and then all the stocks that are small, you form those into a portfolio, you can take the average and evaluate, and then you subtract all the stocks that are big. So it's the same approach for the various factors for profitability, for book to market, for momentum, everything else. You take all the stocks, you sort them based on a characteristic, and then you look at the return difference for that characteristic. The factors, just like our market, can be diversified globally, regionally. So it could be all the small stocks in North America minus all the big stocks in North America, globally, all the small stocks in the world minus all the big stocks in the world. Oftentimes these will be done also based on uh, developed versus emerging. And they can also be country specific. So we can form the same way how we have our market portfolio. We can take all the securities that trade within the market and then sort them based on characteristics. Uh, a word of caution or a, just a, a, a word of experience, because we have differences in the size of our capital markets across countries, sometimes when we're forming our factor portfolios, we'll have to join countries together in order to have enough diversification for our factor portfolios to basically perform well. Again, totally outside of the scope of our class. But if this is something you're interested in, if you're interested in doing portfolio analysis or um, investment arbitrage or um, factor analysis or something like that, it's just something to keep in mind. Okay, so how do you test it? With testing the factor models, the main idea is to use the risk factors on the right-hand side of the regression to explain the excess return, the dependent variable, on the left-hand side of the regression. To determine whether the additional risk factors are economically important, we're gonna do the three steps. Step one, we add them to the regression. How are you gonna test it if you don't put them in the regression? So on the left-hand side, we've got the excess return for the asset, security, fund, market, whatever we're interested in. On the right-hand side, we've got our market factor, which we're very familiar with. We've got the return for small minus big, the return for high minus low, et cetera. Okay, step two is we're gonna examine the intercept to see if it's significantly different from zero. And then we'll also examine the regression coefficients to get a good idea of what the portfolio might contain. We wanna know. So if we find that S, the estimated parameter, the estimated, the regression coefficient for return for small minus big, if we find that S is positive and significant, then likely what's on the left-hand side is uh, small stocks. If we find that S is negative and significant, then likely what's on the right, uh, what's on the left-hand side, li likely what's inside that portfolio are big stocks. The way that we're identifying that is we're basing it on the fact that all of those regression coefficients are covariance divided by variance. So we're gonna use that to identify how is the portfolio or the asset co-moving with, uh, <laughs> with, with the risk factor. Our final little piece of information that we're 
always curious about is our R squared. A good factor model should explain the variation in returns. So our R squared is gonna tell us what percentage of the variation in our left-hand side variable is explained by the variation in our right-hand side variable. The reason why the R squared is something that's important when we think about our factor models is because we also want to make sure that we're accounting for risk. So if the returns on the left-hand side are moving around quite a bit and our risk factors on the right-hand side don't really explain well how those returns are moving around, then we kind of worry that there might be something else that's super important to investors or something else that's affecting the asset on the left-hand side that we're just not accounting for with our model on the right-hand side. Okay. So suppose you would like to evaluate two fund managers. Specifically, you want to evaluate whether the managers have skill and what they might be holding in their portfolio. To determine whether the managers have skill and identify how the funds might be picking stocks, you will regress the excess return of each fund on a multi-factor model. The intercept from the regressions, the alpha, is going to identify skill. So you're going to look at the intercept to ask, is it positive and significant? If it is, then what you're saying is that the risk-adjusted excess return that the fund manager earns beats the market. Why? Because the risk factors that we put on the right-hand side, when we control for risk, if the alpha is positive and significant, we are saying that the excess return that you earn for the fund controlling for risk, the market can't explain it. So you're beating the market. If the alpha is not significantly different from zero, then we say the manager displays no skill whatsoever. If the alpha is negative and significant, that's the worst of all worlds because the manager is underperforming. Why? Well, when we control for risk, given how sensitive the securities are to the risk factors on the right-hand side, if the alpha is negative and significant, we would expect the fund to earn more than it does. So our intercept, our alpha, is really the way that we identify skill. And I'm sure you've heard in finance classes or in popular press, people discussing alpha, alpha, alpha. That's exactly what it is. Alpha is your risk-adjusted excess return. The regression coefficients, our beta, our S, our H, all of our coefficients for our different risk factors, those are gonna identify the investment style or the type of stocks that the fund might be holding. <clears throat> so let's look at our table. Okay, so you've investigated the excess return for these two funds. And what do you have? On the way to read the table is we have our coefficients from our regression output. So we've got our alpha, our beta, our S and our H. B, S and H are the estimated regression coefficients. Alpha is the estimated intercept. Okay, let's look at the first one. What might the fund manager hold? Well, let's look across. First, we can see that these are low beta stocks. Why are they low beta? Because the beta is pretty far from one. The beta is considerably less than one. Is the fund, sorry, is the fund tilting large or small? Well, S is negative, but it's not significant. So even though it feels like the fund might be tilting towards big stocks, the covariance, that negative covariance, it's not significant. So we would say that the fund is neutral on size. What about the last one, value? You can see that H has a value of 1.2 and a T-stat of 2.7. So it's highly significant positive and significant. So we would say that the fund is tilting value. If we put it all together, the fund holds low beta value stocks. 
Does this manager display skill? The answer is no. Why? Because the intercept, the alpha, is not significantly different from zero. Yes, the negative risk-adjusted excess returns, they look bad. So they're almost significant, but they're not significant. So they're not significantly different from zero. Okay. Let's look at the next. Oh, there's one other thing to remember, which is the R squared. The R squared of 0.42 tells us that the three-factor model explains about 40% of the variation in the returns on the left-hand side. Okay. Let's look at the last fund. So first, what might the fund be holding? We can see beta is greater than one and highly significant. It's got a T-set of 3.2. We can see S is positive and significant. S has a value of 0.6 and a T-stat greater than two. And what do we see? We see H is negative and significant. H has a value of negative 1.1 and a T-stat of negative 2.7. So everything for fund two, all of our coefficients, our intercepts, they're all significant. What does that tell us? What might the fund be holding? The fund might be holding high beta, small growth stocks. How did we get there? Well, remember, we're using those coefficients to figure out is the fund on the left-hand side co-moving positively or negatively with that, that different factor. Does the manager display skill? Yes, this manager displays a lot of skill. We've got an alpha of 0.15 with a T-stat of 3.2. 0.15 may not sound like a lot, but if these are monthly returns, that's actually not too bad. That's not too bad at all. Okay, so the manager displays skill for fund two. The manager for fund one does not display skill. What might these funds be holding? We said fund one looks like it's holding low beta value stocks. We said fund two looks like it's holding small, high beta growth stocks. And lastly, you can look at the R squareds and what you observe is that our risk factors, our model can explain 15% of the variation in the returns for fund two and about 40% of the variation in returns for fund one. Okay, so the big picture, we created portfolios that combine one risky and one safe asset, and we know how to combine multiple risky assets. We use the sharp ratio to identify the optimal risky asset. We built the cap M as an equilibrium outcome. The theory predicts that the market is optimal. The market is the optimal risky portfolio, meaning once again, that it has the highest sharp ratio. The theory also predicts that investors hold the market and that exposure to the market is the only systematic risk factor. Exposure to the market under the cap M is the only thing investors are compensated for. We challenge the cap M theory directly by introducing multi-factor models. So we've looked at size, book to market, we also know there's profitability, there's investment, there's momentum, there are many more, many more risk factors. We've also tested this theory of the cap M indirectly with the home bias. Remember, we said that investors in fact don't hold the world market portfolio. They tend to hold way more domestic securities than the cap M theory would predict. We can identify international arbitrage and we can evaluate fund performance. So we can use the alpha to identify risk adjusted excess returns. And we can use regression coefficients, our beta, our S, our H, our P, et cetera, our many regression coefficients to figure out what the fund might actually be holding. So what remains? Given the full range of topics that we've covered since the midterm, the final topics for the course will be supplementary materials that will not be part of the exam. So beyond the current problem set, 
we will not have additional individual assignments or problem sets. Therefore, the materials for fixed income and currency valuation will not be subject to an individual assignment or problem set. What should you be working on? You should certainly be working on your case studies, which are, you know, require quite a bit of analysis and also writing and, and everything else. You should also be working on the problem set that's posted. So uh, we've covered quite a bit of topics. You have learned an extensive amount in a relatively condensed period of time. And we're at a good point for you to uh, apply what you've learned to your case study. So work on your case study, work on the problem set that's posted. The additional materials that will be posted are supplementary. So they won't be for an individual assignment and they won't be for an exam. Okay, uh, that's everything. Thank you.